All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in today. Today we have a very special guest. This is my good friend, Joel Behrman, and one hell of a trumpet and trombone player. Thanks for coming out, Joel. Appreciate you doing this for me, man. My pleasure. Pleasure to be here. All right. Um, first things first, what got you into playing the trumpet? And I know, I know you play trumpet and trombone, and I heard the story of where you actually, uh, you... You, you, you got a choice of playing trumpet or trombone, and they handed you a trombone, and you were like, okay, this is cool? Uh, yeah, I guess it, it, it was kind of like that. I, you know how much control you get in those situations, right? you yeah. got to fill in the holes where they need them. But um, I think, <clears throat> I was thinking about that this morning. Um, I think I asked for a trumpet, and I got a trombone is what happened. Oh, okay. So, because, yeah. um, you know, they go down the line in the classroom, they're like, what do you want to play? And so all my friends are like, trumpet 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 and they got to me i'm like trumpet and then i didn't know the difference so i just was like trombone but my best friend was playing trombone so i was like okay cool i get to sit next to my best friend and um and, what, and play trombone and what grade was that that was fourth grade we had a okay. junior band all right um program where i went to grade school um and then i had my my friend who was playing cornet i spent the night at his house one night and I was like hey can I play that and so I started messing around with it and found out in, intuitively you could pick up a, a little bit of the trumpet by knowing some of the trombone stuff right, right. so because they're they're very similar instruments in a lot of ways you sure. know, in terms of the overtone series and positions and stuff so so it was really easy so I started playing both of them and I I uh I my band director from great from junior band or fourth grade band uh, became my trumpet teacher over the summer. I left that school and went to a different school, a public school, that had an enormous band program. And um, But I wanted to still take private lessons, and so I ended up taking uh, lessons with the director. Uh, her name is Vicki Smolik, um, who, she's like, in St. Louis, she's one of the top trumpet players for shows and classical music, and mm -hmm. um, really kind of showed me everything, you know, about playing brass. Um so, um, I had her as a private teacher pretty much all the way through grade school and partially through high school. And, and So, well, like four or five years? Uh, yeah, at least four or five, six years, somewhere like that. And she was teaching me primarily, primarily trombone, but I started playing more trumpet and learning, you know, classical repertoire and playing, you know, you have those contests when you're a kid and you yeah. try to play for a, a blue ribbon or whatever. And Right. And so I started playing, you know, classical literature on the trumpet and solo literature. And mm -hmm. But I was always playing trombone in the band. So, like, my, my role all the way pretty much through college had always been trombone. Um, and then when I moved out to the Bay Area, um, I was playing both. But then just started getting more calls for trumpet. Mm -hmm. And basically just started practicing trumpet primarily. Mm -hmm. Now it's all I practice, so I touch the trombone. So, so I was thinking about that the other day. You know, if like you know how athletes have cross their their cross trainers. Uh -huh. So it's like, do you feel like when you play trombone, your chops get stronger because it's using a different muscles or different part of your face? Uh, or is that? <laughs> to be honest, I haven't worked out any benefit to playing trombone <laughs> other than money. No, I, <laughs> no, I don't hey, know. Hey, sorry, trombone yeah, player, man. Sorry, it's really no, for trumpet players I, anyway. No. I'm really with you, but, um, <laughs> but not. Um, no, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there is some benefit to, and maybe if I practice more trombone, I would actually discover the benefit. But I don't. I don't. Um, so you don't think there's like, because I remember I used to work at Great America and. and uh, and, and we'd have, we'd play 45 minutes or 40 minutes and we have 20 minutes off. Those were our breaks. And we uh -huh. did six sets a, a day. Wow. And one break, I played the guy's tuba. And I remember for 15 minutes, I just played the tuba during the break. I was shot for the rest of the five sets. Wow. My chops were gone. and But I had never played trombone or tuba. So it was like... I didn't even think about it then. It's like, what if I played tuba? Would my trumpet playing be stronger? I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. Just one of those I, it's an interesting question because um, I know a lot of trumpet players that that try to go down to a bigger, you know, mouthpiece to play trombone or whatever, 
and they really have a tough time with it. Whereas starting as a trombone player and going to trumpet for some reason was easier. Ah, okay. You know, it was like warming up for the big event in a lot right. of ways. Right. But uh, I hand it to those guys. I know a few people that play tuba or sousaphone right. and trumpet just because, you know, you get into a like a second line band mm -hmm. or... You know, in the bandas, that's a thing. You oh, know, man. you play the trumpet, and it's then, you know, the guys that play sousaphone are always the best players in the band, you know? Right. So, um... That crazy articulation. Too, oh, yeah, it's, it's like, insane. It's off the hook. So, um... So, yeah, I don't know. Um, but playing both is definitely... I mean, I think that it it's enhanced my... M like, my melodic and linear kind of movement, mm -hmm. in a way, as far as playing jazz goes. Just because I can... You know, I can hear trombone lines on the trumpet, and vice versa. Uh -huh. So, um, definitely playing trombone after playing trumpet, I definitely have more more like bebop vocabulary, uh -huh. I think, on the trombone than I would have had otherwise. And, okay. and it was a big reason why I wanted to play trumpet, you know, as my main. Anyway, it was because I, you know, you know, trombone's a hard instrument, and it's it's something that uh, I feel like it has limitations that. I want to go beyond, mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, I don't want to work too hard, so I go try to do it easier on the on with the valves. Sure. You know, valves are easy; you can play yeah. lines and stuff. Right. And you can do that on the trombone. There's cats that do it. I just was too lazy to <laughs> to try to. That's a different you know, beast. Oh no, and yeah. I'm not good with you know with uh, failure and stuff like that. But <laughs> even though I fail all the time, but um, but anyway, yeah. So you know, I just trumpet just felt better. Um, you know, as far as just being able to move around. And, sure. And, the agility that you have and the dexterity you have. Right, I'm, right. Are, I'm partial to. So did, did I get that right? You didn't start playing trumpet really until college? Well, no, or I played it played in high school I played too. it in high school. I just never played in an ensemble unless okay. it was something I wanted to do on my own. I was always playing trombone in the school bands. Gotcha. When I got to college, I had my scholarship and, and, and that was my job basically was to play trombone. So... I did play in some ensembles on trumpet, you know, but those were all electives. So mm -hmm. anything that was like a, like a, like a, what's the word I'm looking for? The like a requirement, mm -hmm. um, I would have to play trombone. So which okay. is fine, you know. I mean, I, I got to be in those ensembles, which was cool. Whatever got me right. in was good. Right. So. Right. Um, so you also. Uh, um, so when you were taking lessons, you were taking mostly trombone mm -hmm. lessons, right? The classical lessons. So I, I'm wondering, when you get to University of Miami and you're studying jazz, what, what kind of things did you do? What kind of things were you practicing? Were you, were you, were you that guy that was playing, you know, heads in twelve keys? Were you playing licks in twelve keys? What, what, what kind of stuff were you doing to, that made your jazz playing uh, better? I was doing none of that. Okay. <laughs> I was, no, I mean, I think, I think there were certain things that I, you know, you have to learn your scales and, you know, so they, you know, I, I went with the curriculum. I went where the, I, I was guided with the curriculum and so I practiced the scales and then I, you know, I, you had to practice piano. So I practiced two five ones on the piano mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we learned how to apply melodic minor to, you know, different you know, different types of dominant chords and, you know, minor major seven and just you learn how to apply those things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just funny because in college they dump a bunch of information on you and, right. you know, you, you're you kind of under, under pressure to sift through all that and incorporate it. Right. And... You know, if it doesn't happen for you right away, it's got to happen later on in life, which is kind of what happened to me. You know, I, 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 I was touring with a disco band throughout college, so I, I didn't take my studies as seriously as, mm -hmm. as I would if I were there focused and, you know, not partying and all that stuff that you do in college. Right. But, um, so when I moved out here, that's when I really started to go back and, and, and run through this stuff and really figure it out. Um, and I've kind of developed a system, I think, as far as what to work on when, when working on playing jazz. But uh, the main thing is breaking everything down to its simplest form. So, you know, I, there are certain things like, you know, if you're, if you're a classical player, you study, you know, your technique and then you study etudes and you practice scales and you practice long tones and, uh, you know, different exercises that all, you know, the culmination of bring you to this playing form where you you're 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 able to execute Petrushka or you're able to play, you know, 
the Nutcracker or, or Holst or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so I think that with with jazz and improvisation and bebop, it's the same kind of thing. You work on scales, you work on uh, arpeggios, patterns, you transcribe solos, um, and, you know, the combination of those things and the technique, um, you got to include the technique in there, but the combination of all that stuff makes you able to be ready for a bebop gig. Right. You know? um, so, but as far as... Um, <laughs> I kind of forgot what you asked, but, uh, <laughs> but it, just like, you know, if you could break down, like you said, okay, like the arpeggios and the scales, I mean, and, and the licks and transcribing, of course, you know, that's, that's kind of like the meat and potatoes of, of learning jazz and the language, right? Mm -hmm. Learning how to swing and, yeah. or whatever. Um, could you break it down and be even more specific? Like, usually the last question I ask is what's, what's the thing that helped you the most like for some people it's like a mouthpiece it's a horn or studying with you know this person or listening to that or maybe you you know you were able to i don't know assimilate some sort of exercise or something that really lifted you off the ground jazz wise you know it's like you know for me it was like when the mark levine jazz theory book came out i went oh i read through that and went oh okay I get it. Yeah. This makes sense. Uh-huh. Right? And started putting putting it together that way. Yeah. You know, and, and, and things started to click theory-wise and jazz-wise after that as far as applying the scales and the chords, uh, you know, scales to the chords and what the chords are and how to make the changes. Yeah. So, I guess my question is, what exactly did you do to get where Joel is well, today? Yeah, that's a long process. I know it's... A, I know it's um, not one thing, I can but. yeah I can think of a few things that are are definitely yeah. um, important to like were important to me getting to that next place. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing I think would be because uh, when I was you know when I first started improvising I didn't know I was just oh you're making a melody and 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 that yeah, just know, mess around man. that was good. I didn't really take it seriously it was mm -hmm. more for fun mm -hmm. um, and then I went to a, a a band camp, like a classical band camp at Eastern Illinois University. I was there for a week, and at the end of the week, they asked me to stay for the jazz camp because they needed to fill some chairs, so they were going to give me a scholarship for that, and I went to this jazz camp for a week, and I started to really, you know, I played in a big band, I had theory classes in the morning, it was a very focused and intense study of jazz. So, um, and there was the one of the improv instructors, and he's a trumpet teacher from my hometown, his name's Tom Berkner. And uh, he was teaching at, uh, at uh, uh, University of Illinois at the time. And uh, he, uh, he taught me how to just um, play any kind of scale, whether it's minor, major, or whatever, but play it in di diatonic thirds. Mm -hmm. And so I would go home and I would put on an Abersold or something, just major, minor, you know, the, mm -hmm. all keys. Yeah. And I would play diatonic thirds in the key centers of of those particular studies, you know, right. so you'd go through and there'd be a study in A-flat major and you'd play diatonic thirds. And it got to the point where I could just play over that over and over like a drone in diatonic thirds and I got the key in my head and I got, I was playing eighth notes at that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, anything that gets you playing, you know, it's almost like fake until you make it in a lot of ways. You, right. you get to be, you don't have to understand it necessarily, but it gets you playing. So, um, Can't, b before we go on, just, for our, our listeners, can we uh, can you give us an example? Yeah. Like, let's just do the diatonic thirds in the key of C. Okay. In, a, in trumpet C, right? In yeah, C. sorry. Yeah, we were yeah, talking. I was our thinking key. concert for... <laughs> All right, shall we? <laughs> okay, and then you would do those in different keys, and then... Yeah, play, yeah. Play them in minor and whatnot. Yeah, well, the cool thing about those those... Abersolds were, you know, you just, there was a rhythm section, they were playing a bossa nova or kind of, you know, swing pattern, so it got you kind of feeling the time, and, and mm -hmm. then you, you could apply that harmony over the top, and, and you know, in an eighth note thing, which was the, you know, the goal at the time, you know, mm -hmm. I got so many students that asked me, well, how do I start playing eighth note lines? Well, that's the easiest way I can think of, other than playing the scales. Right. 
you know, is diatonic thirds because it's a lot easier than working diatonic fourths or something else. But then he also told me, you know, you can do the, you know, you know, just stuff like that. Just yeah. find different ways to play, and it all it is is patterns, but they're, you know, they're diatonic and they're, you know, they're they they have some sort of. Uh, not necessarily symmetry, but there's a, there, you know, that's a repeating pattern. But right, right. Anyway, so, so that got me going. That was one thing. Um, the other thing I think probably that took me to a point where I could actually feel like I'm really playing uh, was moving away from college and, and Miami and coming out here and having, you know, for the first time to really, you know, bust my butt to, to get work, and so I had to practice and hustle and be on point, which didn't always happen, you know. <laughs> right. So uh, let's just say I had plenty of distractions, <laughs> but um, you know. Um, so so when you say you know you're 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 bust you know busting your butt, and then there's just like I'm just trying to get into the the thought process and the the practice process of somebody who plays at your level because. When I hear you play, there's there's a couple things. First of all, you you play in time, and and there's a when you play a solo, there's there's a there's a melody, but it's 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 modern sounding. But there's also a I'm not articulating this very well. There's a there's a direction. You know what you're gonna play. It sounds like before you even play it, you're not you're not scuffling. Right. Like when you play, it's like I'm playing this because the melody's in my head and I'm playing. Right. You know what I mean? It's like how do you, how do you, okay. how do you do that, Joel? Well, I I think you're kind of hitting on what I was about to say, okay. which is, <laughs> which is, um, I mean, when I moved out here, I had to take gigs with with whatever I could find. Sure. So mm -hmm. I, I I ended up working with a band at the Serenader in Oakland for like three years, mm -hmm. playing R and B, mm -hmm. you know, two nights a week for like thirty six bucks a night plus tips. So like covers so, and stuff? Or, yeah, or covers like Motown but, stuff or it's Motown and stuff. it was yeah, it was stuff that you would turn on Kiss FM in here. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know? And uh and so playing with a band, you know, and playing you know, with those time elements and, and have you know, playing hard and not you had to play convincing. Mm -hmm. You know, folks that came to those joints, they knew how the music was supposed to sound, and so if you didn't perform up to task, you would you would hear right. about it, you know. <laughs> so um, so th there was that. I started working at the at Glide Church, mm -hmm. um, and I was playing trombone there, um, and Dave Scott was was playing trumpet. Mm -hmm. So I got to hear a great trumpet player every Sunday, which mm -hmm. was cool. Yeah. Uh, I played in the Pearls Band, right. and again next to Dave Scott, Mike Olmos was there. So. Um, so there was a lot of people you had to kind of keep up with, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but um, I think that the the thing I picked up from all that mostly mostly the the, the church gig and the R and B gig, and playing with uh, folks like the Bay Smith and and what is it the the importance of time over everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, time is like that universal constant, you know, not just you know in life. But in music, too, I think time is probably the most important element. So if you have a strong internal clock, you can feel the pulse, then you, you, can, you can place your notes wherever you want. But it's, it's the stronger you feel the beat and the meter, uh, the easier it is for you to say what you want to say. Sure. So sure. for me, that, 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 that sense of time was something that, that wasn't really stressed in college. College... For me, was a, 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 a focus on two things. It was the, the harmony and the scales, and then it was also the sight reading. Mm -hmm. And then, and not that time was wasn't focused on at all, but it just wasn't. To me, it didn't seem like it was a like something that they prioritized. And they probably felt like you were going to get that no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, whereas maybe some some cats don't. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Because there's plenty of great players that play with horrible time. You know? Which seems to be the most, like for my students, is the most difficult thing to teach. It's like, yeah. no, the pulse is here. The metrum, they hear click, 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 and still they're playing out of time. And I'm like, well, no, you need to distract, your, not distract yourself, but you need to separate what you're doing. you got to hear one ear is towards you and the other one's towards the click. So you got to have a spatial sense of time 
and then play in time. Yeah. And sometimes it happens, and sometimes it, it doesn't happen. Yeah. I feel like it's a, a like a bodily thing. I feel like you have to actually have it somewhere in your system, yeah. you know, and you have to... I mean, that's, for me, when I was playing at Glide, I would watch the drummer. Drummer's San Jose native. I don't know if he's native, but he's he lives down here. His name's Ronnie Beck. Mm-hmm. And Ronnie, um, if you're familiar with him, when he plays, he you can see like he nods his head, and he just he kind of you know you can always see him showing some sign of not just the pulse, but even subdivisions mm-hmm. and things like that. Mm-hmm. So when I started watching him and kind of picking that up in other other musicians, mm-hmm. um, I started to do that, and I was like, okay, so that's what it means to feel the time that deeply. It's mm-hmm. just your it's in your body, it's in your system. So. Um, but then, like, you watch a video of, of Trainer Bird, and there's none of that. You know, they're just, like, <laughs> completely statuesque, and, and the only movement besides their fingers is their eyes blinking. So so you don't necessarily have to, like, sit there and groove the whole time, but for me, that, that works. But, but I think, still, you carry it inside somewhere where it's so concrete that it it, it would be, like, a major tra- travesty to, like, falter from the time. You know? Right. It's like, it's so ingrained. Right. I think what happens, too, with, with the, the younger jazz players is, you know, they, they have, they're trying to do so many things at one time. It's like, okay, I have this chord, I know I can play the scale, oh, but now I have to come up with a melody, but now this melody has to be in time. So, it, yeah. there's this lag. I mean, they're coming up, and the pro, you can hear the process going on, but it's not in time. Yeah. So, I think it's, and maybe you'll agree it's just a matter of doing it a lot and over time the two become I, one. I suppose I mean I would I would personally try to put myself into positions where I was forced to, to I mean that means playing with other people's playing one of the things I encounter with with my students I've been teaching at Cal State East Bay for a while um, is that they don't get out and play with other musicians right you know, right. they don't set up their own sessions. Right. They're not trying to be out there gigging. I mean, we were in college and out there gigging. Yeah. You know? So they don't, for whatever reason, they don't have those same opportunities. Maybe because the work's dried up for one, you know, and the other is, you know, I don't know, maybe college is that much harder. Than <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know how it is now. But, um, but yeah, I, I think just getting out and playing and putting yourself in situations where you where you have to play on somebody else's clock or you have to fit in uh, one way or another. The other is, you know, playing along with recordings, not just Abersold, it's not just mm-hmm. with the Metronome, but mm-hmm. all those things combined. Right. But, um, I mean, I would think the goal is to get to a point where you're not really thinking about it, you're just kind of, you're in it. Sure. You're in it. Yeah. You know, it's like if you were in a drum so- circle and you you know, sat on this, this rhythm for a while, you know, you'd, you'd finally absorb it and you wouldn't think about it. You'd just be thinking about, you know, you know, whatever. You <laughs> right, know? right. You know, yeah, because it seems like once you start thinking about it, you're done. Yeah, right. It's too, too late. Yeah, it should you're just be natural. And t- I mean, I think rhythm and time is, I mean, that's a, that's a basic human thing, almost the same as, you know, breathing or blinking or anything like that. We all have it in us. Right. You know, we all have music in us, and time is part of music. So I think right. it's 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 there. It's just a matter of tapping into it. Yeah. Let's talk about who are your some of your favorite players are, and 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 why. Okay. I know yeah. you're you're a Miles guy, like I, most of us. I yeah, I think yeah. if if you're a jazz musician and really just a musician in general, and you don't like Miles, there's something wrong. <laughs> you know, because I mean, I mean, I mean, I think there's certain elements of him that are definitely like I would prefer somebody else over this but but as a musician as a mm-hmm. whole mm-hmm. and he's he's up there with my top five right and, you know maybe right. top two I remember my uh in, in high school getting into miles and, and going yeah people talk about this miles guy he's a jazz he's a jazz guy and the first so I, so I go to Tower Records which was a record store which <laughs> they don't have anymore what are those and I and I went to the Miles Davis section I pulled out Jack Johnson Oh. And I put it on. I was like, "What is this? Is is this jazz? What's this like? It's like rock. It's like Jimi Hendrix." And I was like, totally confused. Like, where's the swing, man? And I was like, ah, maybe I don't like Miles. Yeah. And I was just, I didn't really know anything about Miles. And then I figured out, okay, this is his jazz rock fusion period. I was like, oh. And then you go back and you go, okay, well, this is the jazz I was looking for. Yeah. 
And then and then he gets into the hip hop thing and he did the Marcus Miller thing, the tutu and all that, which I love. All that stuff now. But it Miles was a real it was a trip because I didn't realize he had periods. Oh yeah. Yeah. Too many of them. Whereas like Louis Armstrong, you're pretty much gonna get Louis Armstrong in, in mm -hmm. the New Orleans sound. Yeah. And swing. You yeah, know? Miles changed music like five or six times. Right. Changed jazz. Right. And it's a trip to think about how, you know, he did some kind of project or had some band and then all of a sudden, everybody else is trying to do that. Right. You know, he, he was really, the first. He's a pioneer in a lot of ways. He's like at the so, forefront of every you know uh, new genre that comes up. You know, he's at yeah. the front, cool, and then modal, and then jazz rock fusion, hip, even hip hop and jazz and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But I hear what you're saying about you know Jack Johnson, not necessarily that, but just the concept of because like when I first heard Charlie Parker, I was like, that's cr that's too crazy and out for me. Crazy, I know. And and then you know I got into it and you understand it a little more right. and then all of a sudden it makes sense. Yeah. You know, so it's like you your your brain only allows you to to comprehend so much, you know, at the time. You right. Know? And then all of a sudden you expand and find different things that lead you back to that or something like that. And, sure. You know. But uh yeah, Miles is definitely one. You know, Freddie Hubbard is a a huge influence. I was listening to Freddie when I was, you know, in grade school and and digging one. I mean, for me, he was a transformative player. Sure. You know, um, and uh, I, those two guys really kind of brought me through college in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. But I checked out other cats, Clifford Brown, of course, sure. and Lee Morgan, and I listened to some of the younger guys uh, at the at my time when I was in high school. So that would have been like Roy Hargrove and Wallace mm -hmm. Roney, mm -hmm. uh, Winton, of course. Um, so I mean, all the cats you know that I listened to as trumpet players. I listened to a lot of trombone players because I was sure. so I checked out JJ and and Curtis Fuller, mm -hmm. um, and then you know Cats because I was a trombone player so I checked out Bill Watrous and sure. and uh, uh, Carl Fontana and um, you know I mean I I can name off a bunch of people but uh, but to answer your question I think I think uh, I don't know Miles and Freddie were really the Cats. So what what is it about Freddie Hubbard that that you're really attracted to? Uh, I I don't know. Freddie is like the perfect combination of you know strength yeah. on the trumpet. I mean, he's such a beast. Um, articulation, articulation, and Sense of swing and time. Yeah, and then just doing things that are impossible, like <laughs> no. you know the 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 stuff that he does. The acrobatics are are crazy and. And uh, impossible. I don't know too many cats that can do like yeah. nowadays. There are great trumpet players that can't do what he did. Know. You know, and just taking the trumpet and and turning it into an instrument where, where oh, I've never heard that on that instrument before. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but you know, and then the other musical things. You know, his melody is the the hipness of the lines he plays. Mm -hmm. You know, his ability to move in and out of the changes and. And, but most of all, just his power. I mean, I can say the same thing for Clifford Brown. Clifford Brown's a beast. Amazing. You know, if I was going to recommend one trumpet player for somebody that wants to learn how to play bebop, he would be the guy. Right. You know, he's got, right. he has all the vocabulary that you would ever need. Right. You know? Right. To play bebop. Right. Yeah. You know? Amazing. Yeah. I remember um, talking about, you know, playing things that are totally difficult and can't believe it's being played on a trumpet. In high school, I got a, a transcription a book of all Dizzy's solos and I open it up and it has a lot of 16th notes and it's really high and they're really long and I looked at it and I just closed it and I was like there's no way I'm going to be able to play. I'm not going to be able to play this man yeah you know and uh, uh, so it was a long time before I could even come back yeah because I just listened to it and go man I just how does he do that right and it was it's inspiring but also you know how you get it's like can't do that how do you do that yeah how it's daunting get... it's daunting yeah. totally yeah right yeah well i'm i mean yeah i'm working on a freddie hubbard lick off of uh one of his tunes and it's just a lick but it's a super fast lick it's one of his little runs but you know just something yeah, that's yeah, yeah. impossible right and so i have this program called transcribe that i use and i can section off this this lick and right. i can slow it down to like 30 percent right and still, you know, figure out what he's playing and then try to work it in, you know, at a faster tempo. And it's, you know, right. but 
you know, I can spend two hours on that and not get very far and then have I to, I'm, I'll put it aside and won't come up back to it for months. Right. Because I know that, you know, that's the limits of my technique right uh -huh, now. Uh -huh. So until I figure something else out that enables me to, to move faster or play faster, right. I'm not going to be able to get any further on that lift. So it's almost like what we're doing is applying like a classical sense of practicing to jazz, right? You know, just take, take like if you're playing the Hummel Trumpet Concerto, you start it slow. And, yeah. Right? Well, I think to, to gain any ground, um, no matter what you do, you have to, you have to break it down into it its down. simplest form, almost like an atom, you know? Yeah. Molecules break down into atoms, break down into protons, electrons, and, you know, uh -huh. and subatomic particles and right. all that stuff. Well, it's the same with, you know, uh, with, with tunes, uh -huh. you know? You break a tune, no matter how hard it is, you can break it down into its simplest form and work on, you can work on voice leading between two changes right. by setting a loop. And then just playing over that ad nauseum, you know. At a slower tempo. At a slower yeah, tempo yeah, or so speeding it up, you know. Yeah. However, however you got to learn it, but you just break it down into you know sections or loops or just like if I was transcribing in solo, I'd do the same thing. I'd, I'd break it down into eight bars, four bars, two bars, or whatever mm -hmm. I needed to, mm -hmm. and then you reassemble it, you speed it up, and then it's like you've put together this nice IKEA trumpet solo you know <laughs> and it's yeah. you know there it is yeah. you know and it'll it'll stand the test of time so, so when, when you transcribe it so I, I assume you're not writing it down you're just doing it by ear no you just play. i'll write it down if if it's something i want to give to somebody right or uh but you know I, I can i can play through a lick and think about what notes i'm playing in the chord that i'm playing over and figure out oh yeah that's what that is that's mm -hmm. how he's doing that that's mm -hmm. how he's outlining that chord oh that was slick how he went you know up a half step and then landed here you know i can figure that stuff out um to me the there there are several gains for transcribing just by learning a solo one is internalizing the solo itself you're internalizing all those licks mm -hmm. you know you if you really get into the solo and you play like you try to match the sound and articulation and mm -hmm. the inflections, then you're gaining all that. Right, the language. Yeah, yeah. you're internalizing everything. Um, so vocabulary, harmony, sound, articulation. Um, and then the most obvious benefit is you have the horn on your face the whole time. Right. You know? So if I'm, I'm never stronger than when I'm transcribing. Yeah. Never. Because yeah. when I'm transcribing... I'm playing, you know, you lose track of time. You're playing over a loop, try to get it, and you're just playing and playing and playing and playing. And you realize, oh, 10, 15 minutes, is, I, haven't take, I haven't taken the horn off my face. And you wonder why your chops yeah. are so swollen. Is right. That, well, yeah. What happened? Exactly. Oh, I've been playing 15 minutes straight. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember I, I did a, a Clifford Brown solo on... Uh, um, I, I can't remember the name of the song. Uh -huh. It'll pop in my head. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, after you've gone, uh -huh. six choruses, you know, <laughs> of of Clifford, right? Playing pretty. I don't think I ever got it completely up to speed, but um, I mean, there's no etude that would give me that amount of technique, no. you know, in the no. world. Yeah. So. You know, that's a great study. And you're doing it by ear and you're internalizing it yeah. and, and trying to play it in time. Yeah. And the and same that, inflections and yeah. articulations and sound and vibrato and yeah. sound like one person. Yeah, if you want to talk about a, a, a transformative moment in, in my education, yeah. that would have been one too. You know, School of Clifford Brown because yeah. all of a sudden I'm, you know, I'm playing his vocabulary, his right. ideas. And and so all of a sudden I had new bebop concepts and, right. and new strength in, right. in, in my chops. so I remember playing a, a Clifford Brown solo and then, you know, he would do this thing where he'd be play, he'd play two courses, three courses, and then he'd go up into the upper register and he'd have a strong G or something. I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm shot. It's like, what am I going to do? How do, I, how, how do you do that? Yeah. And then, like, just before this interview, we were talking about, you know, chops and, and whatnot. It's like, you just got to figure it out. Yeah. Because nobody can go, you got to put your lips right there and then, you know, it's just like, yeah. everybody's different. Everybody's see, different. Yeah. And my, my embouchure has changed yeah. in the last 10 years. I think it, they always change. I think it's never, I mean, I, I'm, I'm no expert. So, I mean, 
you know, for some people, maybe it's like it has to be the same. But I think your right. mouth changed. I mean, yeah. teeth change, your everything teeth change, changed, everything. You know. So we were talking about how your your chops. You feel like your chops have changed. I mean, did you ever go through an embouchure change or if even backing up? Who did you just find an embouchure that worked for you, or did somebody say, you know, say M, put the mouthpiece on your face and go? I mean, can you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, most of my most of my embouchure, um, my focus on embouchure was done on trombone. Mm. So uh, I had a I had two teachers, trombone teachers, when I was at Miami. One was Dr. Charles Campbell, mm -hmm. and he was more he he pushed me more about sound production and air and stuff like that because you know when you're playing jazz you always want to back off and try to play you know real light and he was like damn it man you know just you know put some air through the horn right you know. Um, and Dante, um, Dante Luciani, um, was my jazz teacher and his focus was on, first of all, long tones and, and just making sure that your sound was nice and round and, uh, mm -hmm. and open and then ab about keeping your corners tight. Mm -hmm. And so as long as those two things were there, you know, the air and, and the corners, then everything was good and he, he would always be able to pinpoint the time when I let my corners drop or something like that. He was mm -hmm. really good about that. So um, the more I focused on that, the better my embouchure was in general. I never had to really worry about placement on trombone. It was always where it needed to be. And I think I think some of that just has to do with where your teeth are. Like I have a tooth that kind of sticks out here. And so, you know, I would kind of anchor my mouthpiece somewhere where in relation to that, I'm not sure. It wasn't really centered. It may have been off, offset a little bit. When I was playing trumpet, though, um, for whatever reason, I started playing off to the side, mm -hmm. and uh, everybody would say, "Man, your embouchure is so funny. How are you getting?" Because it was it was weird. It was like off like here, that far off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and I don't know what happened, but just somehow it just started to get more. It just moved, and I didn't think about it. I didn't. Do it. it just just kind of happened naturally. So I don't know if that was maybe just because I was I was practicing more trumpet and doing more studies and and just started setting up the right way. Was but, it it wasn't conscious like I'm going to set more in the middle? It mm -hmm. just floated. It just floated there. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So I feel like my amateur's in a good place, but you know, if I took a lesson with you know Jay Rosetta or or somebody, mm -hmm. I, they might set me straight. <laughs> you know, so I, I it's something I been meaning to do because you know it's like you always find limitations in your playing and mm -hmm. you wonder if there's some adjustment you need to make um, is there a better way saying, yeah it's just gotta be a better way yeah should I switch mouthpieces again it's not yeah, should I get a Maybe different it's my trumpet horn. yeah <laughs> let me try 16 different trumpets and then come back to the one I was originally playing yeah and go oh now yeah. it's just me yeah <laughs> I keep practicing yeah yeah and I noticed too you're like you know a lot of trumpet players have the shredded chops. Like, your chops aren't all shredded looking, you know? Yeah. You know, I, like, people have, like, shrapnel hanging to oh, divots and stuff. Oh, yeah. You mean just when they they haven't played for two days no, and there's still, just, like, a mark there or something No, like just, oh. like, they're shredded. Yeah. Like, a lot of lead players. Oh, yeah. You see some guys, you know, like, Lewis's chops aren't... Lewis Fasman, he doesn't have shredded chops. And yeah. And Bright doesn't. But some other people do you look at their faces like that guy's a trumpet player because there's like a cut and a bunch of shrapnel hanging out like yeah. i just i just heard this story that lewis armstrong he was back in the dressing room and he was peeling like he had a like a tweezers and he was peeling his lip like that he goes and then somebody's interviewing and asking what are you doing man it's like i gotta i gotta take off all this uh skin because it clogs my mouthpiece and he would take months off because he would crack his lip. Oh, wow. From playing yeah. so hard. And you look at his lip and you go, okay, yeah. Or Miles' lip. Yeah. You know? And and I think Clifford. Anyway, it's just, yeah. you're just looking at, well, man, those lips are shredded. Yeah. Yeah, you've been playing hard. Yeah, I, play, I guess that's a lot of pressure if you, if, you, if, you, <laughs> yeah. if, you pull, if you pull the horn. And I do that every now and then, especially yeah. if I'm playing, you know, like a pop gig or somewhere and playing Loud more high notes. High or yeah. Something. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think my injuries come in other places like hernias <laughs> okay, and headaches. Don't get me started with hernias. And stuff. So, yeah. so yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think I play with too much pressure, but I definitely there are times when 
I know I cut off the circulation, and mm -hmm. it, and it'll it'll mess with you know your endurance for the night and stuff oh, like yeah. that. You have to... for the next three days, right? Yeah, <laughs> to all of the above. Yeah. yeah. But uh, did you did you ever do like uh, Caruso exercises? You know, where you keep the horn on your face and do it until failure. Yeah. yeah. Were you, did you ever do anything? No. Stuff? Um. You know, I have that Caruso book, and I and I played through it, and I, I not to say I shouldn't go back to it. I think I, you know at some point I'll. I'll check in and see if there's any way that I can find some benefit out of playing it. Mm -hmm. But I always kind of lean towards, um, like, the Clark book, you know, because mm -hmm. I wanted to get into the dexterity. Sure. And uh, I played a lot of the colon exercises mm -hmm. that yeah. kind of got That's me up stuff. into the upper register yeah. solidly, you know. Yeah. So, like, and, and once I started doing those colon exercises... Um, I things kind of showed up for me in the upper register for sure. Like I, I started to be very, very consistent with my air and and sound in those upper for the high C's and D's and things mm -hmm. like that. So yeah. as soon as I started playing those exercises, it it opened that whole register up for me. So were they the expanding range mm -hmm. exercises yep. in particular, where it's they're basically lip uh, slurs, right? Yeah. And then they have the other one which is lip trills, and they have another one which is uh, intervals. Yeah. So if you do like those three, those are just killer. Yeah, yeah, I'm and they hurt your chops. Now, like yeah, your chops. Yeah, they. I, well, I, and they I, hurt me mentally too. Yeah, it's right. like, wow, why can't I do? That? Well, yeah, it's a. It, I mean, it is. It's you have to concentrate to get them out right. And I used to do them really slow. Yeah. You know, I'd do them super slow so that I would, and I would do them with a tuner when I was doing them slow, oh, yeah. so that I made sure that when I would make that transition, that it would be as close to a tune as possible. Yeah. And then I would work on speeding it up. But I always. When I first started a new study, I would play with a tuner so that I, I, I because you figure you got to pivot from every note that you play. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're off on the next note that you play, then the note after that is going to be off, and subsequently everything that follows. So right. the 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 goal is to play every note perfectly. Then you you have to make sure that you're doing that. So right, right. You know. So bust out the tuner and the yeah. metronome and make sure you're being all those tools are important. Good tone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then it becomes it's like work. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> Not, well, you're not yeah. just messing around anymore. You know, you're like really trying to accomplish something. I guess the 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 goal would be to to find a way to enjoy that that work part of it. You know, like to to oh. dig into the challenge. And some days you're in the mood for it, and some days you're just you just want to put on a tune and play along with it or something. Right. Right. So, um, and that's the thing is kind of reading where you're at. I guess so. Um, people yeah. pe people talk about motivation, and I'm like, motivation only lasts so long. You know. So, like, what do you do to get motivated to play? In those days where you're like, man, I don't, know, I don't want to play today. Do you put on a tune and just play along, or you listen to somebody? Or I think that's my fallback. Probably is yeah. is if I if I don't feel like oh, I don't want to get into this these this thing I have to work on, I, I'll put on a tune and just try to have fun. Yeah. Um, and then nine out of ten times, like I'll be playing that tune and I'll be like, well, I'm not hitting that that. Um, a turnaround right. Right. So let me turn this off, and I'll go to the piano, and I'll work that out, and then I'll and then I'll, maybe I'll put the tune in to transcribe, and I'll section off that. You know, I'll find different ways to. So now you're practicing. To, I'm basically yeah. <laughs> I'm tricking myself into yeah, into working good. on something, that's or good. you know, on a technical um, on a technical tip. Like if if I'm playing a melody, or if I'm playing a solo, and something's not working out, I'll, I'll stop. And how can I? work this out what do right. I need to do to facilitate me playing this lick that I just made up not that I'm ever going to use it again sure but it's like the more technique you have I mean look at Wynn he's got insane technique he can Maybe. play anything he wants right you know so it's like how do I how do what do I need to work on to facilitate executing those kind of things right so right. um so that's that's what I do I kind of trick myself into playing um, the other thing I do is like if if I feel like I'm in a stale rut, I'll listen to a bunch mm -hmm. of music, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be classical or pop or whatever. I'll just like try to listen to as much music as I can, and then I go back to listening to trumpet players because that's the easiest thing to draw you into the horn. Sure, sure. So I'll listen to whatever and find find some sort of motivation there. Yeah, you know? I'll I'll do that too. It's like. Uh... Maybe I'm not into practicing that or I'm tired or whatever, and I'll listen or I'll watch a video, mm -hmm. you know, on YouTube, and I'll go, "Whoa, that guy's really good. Yeah. That's really amazing." 
Well, yeah. Why am I taking a break right now? I got so much work to do. Right. So I'll get inspired that way. Sometime. Yeah. And so. and you know, let's not um, leave out live shows and stuff like that too. Yeah. You go hear somebody yeah. live, and, and you know, it doesn't even have to be your instrument. It's just go hear some live music and it kind of gets you pumped and mm-hmm. like oh yeah this is my job this yeah, is what right, I do I do yeah. what they're doing right you know right. so it's time for me to 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 step up yeah. you know that yeah. kind of thing and that's the thing it's always a challenge to to get on stage and 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 step up to the moment mm-hmm. and if you don't see that and practice that part of things then all the practice that you do in your shed isn't going to amount to anything, you know, so you have to, you have to get out there and see shows, and you have to get out there and be a part of shows, and and play with real life humans, yeah, Yeah. it has to be that way, otherwise, what's the point, right, yeah, (laughs) I do, yeah, so, talking about being on stage, now, you recently, uh, had, had been, uh, the, uh, musical director with, is it Philip Phillips, yeah, right, yeah, so, talk, talk, you know, that's, that's a pretty big time gig, so, Tell me about that experience and uh, and how you got the gig and and what was that was like. Uh, the Philip Phillips thing was came out of nowhere actually. Um, I was at home on a Saturday with my wife and I just got this text from uh, Errol Cooney, who's a was a local guitar player. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's from Houston, but he lived in the Bay for a while, and he was Phillips N D, and he had asked a friend, you know, I need a trumpet player for two months for this run. Mm-hmm. And the friend referred me, and that's how I got the gig. And I, and it's a matter of, you know, all those gigs usually are just referrals, yeah. you know. So right. it's like who you know and right. and are you capable of being on the road. Right. You know, are you <laughs> capable of, of hanging with people on a bus 24-7. 24-7. And, you know, doing your job on stage as well. Um which I guess I was, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> maybe sometimes. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that's how I got into that scene and it was great. You know, I, I, uh, I listened to the music, I got the music like maybe, you know, like a month or so in advance and I took my time learning all the tunes. You memorize everything that you're doing. You don't go in with any kind of music. No stands, yeah, no, no. no sheet music. No, I mean, nowadays, I, you know, it's cool to have like an iPad or something if you right. want to sketch some notes or something, right. but... Eventually, you end up getting rid of all that stuff because you right. don't need it. You got the show in your head. Right. You know, but uh, yeah, we had like a week of rehearsals and the band was killing. It was Jason Thomas on drums and um, it was J.J. Smith on bass and, and um, Bobby Sparks on keys. Mm-hmm. Um, this cellist, Dave Egar on, on cello, right. amazing cello player. And uh, Errol was playing guitar. Did you play some keys on the game? I did this last uh, this last part of the run that I did. Right. Um, just because um, we didn't really have a dedicated keyboard player. We had Dave Eggar was playing mm-hmm. uh, cello, and he was trying to cover as many keyboard. He's a, like a concert pianist, so he, right. he's more than capable of handling <laughs> anything. But there were times when he wanted to play cello, right. so I would cover keyboard parts. Okay. Or there were just things where he would want to play string parts or organ parts and I would cover like a Rhodes part or a piano okay. part and this my piano chops are not they're not show quality at all I'm just basically holding down like you know either pads or playing like a part that never moves or never changes. but you have enough chops you know enough theory to know okay this is these chords and yeah I'm playing time and yeah you know, if, you if I can work at it chops, and practice yeah. with it I can sure. I can play that I do that on Chile show too I play. right a lot, a lot of utility. That's kind of what I've become in that scene is like uh-huh. a utility kind of guy that covers. Seems trumpet players do that a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, you know, in, in a in an age where there's not a lot of uh, gigs for horn sections right. anymore, you know, you want to you want to make sure that you have some bases covered otherwise. Yes. And it's not. I mean, it's good to learn that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I just want to get better at it if I can. So, uh-huh. so I could play maybe just keys on a gig sometime. I've always wanted to do that. I've just never practiced piano hard enough. It's kind of fun you know. too. I mean, play little keys, little trumpet, maybe doing some background vocals. It's you know, it's kind yeah. of yeah. Oh yeah, no, I, that that part of it too. I I did sing some See? background. Yeah, I was proud of that. I took a vocal <laughs> lesson. And everything. I'm sure I sounded horrible. I'm sure I don't want to good go back to and get hear those tracks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but, uh, but yeah, at that time, the band was great, and, and it was a jam band, and it was, you know, so there would be a lot of, a lot, I was the only horn player, so there was a lot of space for me to, to improvise. Which is and, cool. Yeah, and it wasn't just, you know, like, 
simple rock stuff. It was like pretty cool cycles and things like that. And mm -hmm. the band was great, so we would all push each other in those moments. So nice. it was a real supportive environment, and the band was incredible. It was one of the best bands I've ever played with. So, so you were the Chris Body of uh, of Phil Phillips. Yeah, so, in yeah. a lot of ways. That's, I always that thought that be... was such a cool gig. It's kind of the yeah. first, well, not the first, but you know, only a trumpet player playing with the you know a pop huge pop star. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, so what? I can just noodle around like Branford Marsalis did, and it's like, that's cool. That's very cool. And fun. Yeah, and, but you're still an integral part of the of the artistic yeah. endeavor. Yeah, and and definitely, you know, it, I mean, validated too. I mean, he's he's got his own career now where he's touring constantly. Right. You know, he's kicking butt. I heard him when he was in San Francisco at SF Jazz. I have a friend, Cy Smith, that sings with him, and uh, and yeah, he's his show is great. Mm -hmm. He has a, an amazing band, and he's playing his music. Right. And sounds perfect. Yes. You know. It's a beautiful show. It's clean. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so um so he's definitely worthy of everything that he got and, and I mean I can't think of a bigger guy to play with, you know, as far yeah. as I mean, yeah, I mean I guess there are other cats, I don't know. But I mean that's, that's, still a, that's, that's huge. Still a big gig. I mean yeah. you're on the road, you're touring. Yeah. And and you know, tell us a little bit something about being on the road. How it's it's you know, it's not all glamour. It's uh <laughs> no. It's it's a lot of traveling and a lot of humping your own stuff sometimes and carrying your own stuff and or or even if you don't you're still it's it's exhausting. Just yeah. going from point A to point B. I'm trying to think of the least <laughs> glamorous thing about <laughs> There's a lot. Cuz there's a lot. Yeah. I think maybe uh maybe when you're on the bus and you're about two hours away from where you need to go, like yeah. you get because you bus at night and you get to your your place, you know, at two in the morning or or whatever, and your bus sits there or but later. Yeah, yeah, if you don't, you can't go to the bathroom on the bus. Right, you can't number two on the bus. Anyway. <laughs> no, so, but if you have to, home. you have to find a way. So that's yeah. probably the least glamorous <laughs> thing is like finding a solution to, uh, to yes. defecating on the bus that won't offend anybody. <laughs> that's you know? right. So, um, but no, I mean, there's just, there's, there's trials like any kind of touring gig, you know, the, 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 the tour I'm on now, it's not really a tour, it's more like, you know, a lot of weekend and one-offs and stuff like that. We fly everywhere. Are you, you talking know? about Sheila E? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so, um, so, you know, that's, that's nice. There are perks to flying, you know, you get to come home mm -hmm. a lot, you know, not and uh, you're not gone time. continuously. Yeah. Um, but you know, as I do, that airports can be exhausting. You know, right. You, that part of travel where you're waiting, your flight gets delayed, you're sitting on a plane, the up and, and, the up and down takes a toll on your organs and, yeah, you, yeah. you know, everything. So, so there's, you know, there's pluses and minuses to different types of touring, but I, you know, right now I kind of enjoy being able to be at home for mm -hmm. a certain amount of time and, sure. and staying connected with the local musicians too, yeah. like, you know, in the local scene, and because I think when people hear you're on a tour, they just oh, yeah. assume you're always on tour, right? You know, and then you stop getting those calls, and then you get home, you don't really care about it. You know, when you should, you should be like on the phone hustling, right? You know, it's like you get into your little rut. And you're like, oh, I'm good. I got to the point where I I didn't tell anybody I was leaving. Yeah. I just go and I keep my book with me, so I have my phone. Mm -hmm. When people call, and I'll just say, oh yeah, I can do that gig. Mm -hmm. I just want to tell anybody, which I don't know probably not the best thing to do but i didn't want to know i didn't want anybody to know i was gone yeah because i'd be home for six months and they go i thought you were still gone it's like no no yeah. i've been home for a year or yeah. six months or whatever so I, I know that can be that can be an issue yeah what would you recommend doing or practicing for somebody who's just getting into jazz like what maybe some things that you do with your students or is that somebody just wants to get into it um, Any tips? Well, yeah. If the if the if if you, I'll just we'll zero in on the trumpet player, right? I yeah. Mean, okay. So uh, if I'm teaching a kid who's like, okay, I, I've been playing school music and marching band and all this for long enough, I want to really learn how to play some jazz. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I do is make sure that they have stuff to listen to, because mm -hmm. without that, you have no reference. Right. You know. So it's really important to. I mean, when I was. At that point in my learning, uh, I was fortunate there was a trombone player. There's a 
Air Force Base, close to where I used to live, Scott Air Force Base, outside mm-hmm. of Belleville, and there was a trombone player named Scott Crump. Um, and he would, we would play together in a, like a college big band, because I was playing with uh, like the, the community college big band, just so I'd have some other outlets other than school. Mm-hmm. And so he would play in that band, and then we'd play in a section together, and he was a, an amazing trombone player, and so he had all these albums of different things, so he'd make me mix cassettes mm-hmm. of different musicians, trombone players, and so that got me listening to so-and-so, and then I would branch out from there. I was studying with a, a trombone player named Brett Stamps uh, at uh, SIUE, Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville, and he hit me to Wayne Shorter mm-hmm. and other people that weren't trombone players. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to you have to have a way to branch out and hear the hear the language and the vocabulary and what everybody's saying and how they're doing it. You start to formulate in your head. Oh, how does that happen? You know, ask questions. How are they doing this? How is this sound? How how how? Mm-hmm. You know, all right. of that. You know, you st- the, if if you're interested in it, if you're if you if you listen to all that music and you're not really you go back to like listening to you know the rolling stones or the cure not that those are you know but that's what kids were listening to you know at the time when i was in high school Mm -hmm. i was listening to charlie parker right and herbie hancock right you know and i didn't really want or listen to nirvana or you know metallica or whatever i just didn't i just wanted to listen to jazz so it takes a special person to get into that stuff and want to listen to it for one so if if they're into that, then I think it's good to move on and say, okay, well, then you need to work on these scales. You need to work on blues scales. You need to check out bebop scale. You need to check out all your major scales. You need to learn how uh, Dorian minor, which is the modes, you know, you, you work mm-hmm. on all their modes. You don't have to work on all of them. You just work on the ones that, that uh, I mean, it's good for them to understand modes, but it's more important that they, they work on the ones that they're going to be able to apply. Right. So, um, and then, you know, melodic minor. I saw that, that thing you did with scales and all those scales that you talked about, mm-hmm. diminished and whole tone. Mm-hmm. You know, bebop is an, a really important scale, I think. And uh, and the blues scale is really important. It's something that, that we kind of take for granted, I think. Uh, it is, you know, just incorporating, you know, the bluesier elements into your playing somehow. You know, I mean, it's not a, I don't think it's a, a, a rule, but I think it's a something that we should all be you know, considering <laughs> yeah, we're definitely. playing, I mean, it's our, our this music comes from the blues, so right. it's like it's like yeah. you don't want to leave that that part of the roots of the music out. Right. So I think it's really important that that, and you know, the, and then it, when it comes down to playing with cats, if you have all this other stuff and you don't have the blues in your playing, they might not want to play with you because right. you you're kind of boxing yourself into this kind of being this kind of player, he plays everything but the blues, you know, right. it's not going to work. Right. You know, that so kind of thing. lacking in a, a little bit of foundation. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Exactly. You want to be as well-rounded as possible. So, but I'm, I'm kind of getting off that. I mean, as far as just reckon, the listening thing is so important. And then the second thing is, is the scales, learning play melodies, and transcription. Learning how to transcribe. Is so listening part. first. Yeah. And then getting into the theory of it, and then yeah. definitely transcribing. Yeah. And that seems to be like the daunting task of, of younger students who are like, I gotta pick these notes out of the air. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, now there's never been a better time really? to transcribe with all these apps and stuff. You could slow stuff down. Now, are you a, a purist who says, no, man, don't slow the don't slow it down. You know, do it like they did when you know Lester Young did it or something. Yeah, there's. I think there's times when I try to force myself mm-hmm. to do it, but then it's like. You know why am I, why am I, abusing myself why by trying? Using, you yeah. know, it, it, here it is. There's an easier way to do it, and <laughs> right. you're gonna get. It. To me, it's like, if if you can't get it slow, you're not gonna get it fast. You know, right? And a lot of things, especially if it's a real technical part of the solo, right? You know, it's better to learn it slow, mm-hmm. and then speed it up. If get you it learn it, yeah. If you learn it slow, the time and the articulation, the air, all the mechanics involved uh-huh. are going to be better at the faster tempo it's not going to be worse so it's right. like you know right. it makes sense to to slow things down and, and it it is i mean we're in a we're in, we're in a great period technologically where we have so many tools in our belt that we can use you know um the i real b allows you to isolate 
two chords at a time so you can you can work on your voice leading in right. small increments and then expand yeah. them right. you know transcribe you can learn solos that w would be otherwise impossible to learn mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so yeah i'm not really a purist when it comes to that i think you know just learn it however however whatever works for you, you know, and it'll get easier and faster as you go right. you know you like right. you become faster as your ear becomes more attuned to picking things up you start learning the language and so that's that lick that that Charlie Parker played is, you know, in a, a you know, a Joe Henderson solo or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that would actually happen, but, but you I'm just saying, the dots yeah, easier, right? yeah, you start to hear those licks yeah. and you start to hear, you know, how they are outline harmonies and how they maneuver from this change to this change. And, and yeah, it's all, it's all about learning a language. Literally, it's a language, right. you know, we, we, we communicate through our instruments using the licks that our ancestors played, you know, right. and so it's, you know, it's really about that. And that's, that's the thing for young kids is you don't want to miss out on that. If you, if you, if you jump straight into the younger generation of musicians, that if you do that without going back and learning the language, then you're not going to have any of that foundation. Right. And I'm, and, and maybe you don't want that. You know, right. maybe you want to be completely modern and not play anything that has any kind of historical reference or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, you are boxing yourself into a certain type mm -hmm. of, of jazz, mm -hmm. even. You know, whereas, you know, if you have all that, then you branch out from there. Yeah. You know. It seems like now in, a, a lot of kids start at bebop. Yeah. And then they don't even go, like, swing, forget it. And then Louis Armstrong is like, well, who? Yeah. I mean, they know him, but that music is just so old. Which yeah. is the reaction I had in high school. is like... Dixieland, what is, eh, I'm not into it. And well, then the older I got is like, amazing. Lewis, I mean, what do you say? Yeah. Well, yeah, I know. It's it's funny. The swing has kind of been filtered down yeah. through the generations. So yeah. the hardest swinging bands were those cats, you know, Louie and yeah. Ellington and Basie and, um, and, you know, all that stuff was swinging so hard. You know, you, you you couldn't apply that swing to today's standards, right? Without it sounding a little a little strange, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I, I I shouldn't comment on the progression of the music, I suppose, because it's not, you know. What do you mean? Like uh, as far as like what, uh, if I approve or disapprove of the direction or anything like that, I don't think it's. I don't think there's. Uh, an approve or disapprove kind of thing. I yeah, think, yeah. I think it's just, you know, you do your thing and you do the way you want oh, it. Oh, I see. And, yeah. 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 Well, do you. Yeah. Do what you need to do. Yeah, and, and uh, we have to completely, we always have to remind ourselves of that, you know, yeah. not to let other people get into your head. Yeah. And, and Which can happen. Oh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's really a tragedy, you know. It's yeah. like, you know, you always consider, I mean, the, I think the thing to do is just to, to try to make that connection with with whatever, I mean, I think there's there's points when I'm playing where I'm I'm completely locked in to what I'm doing, and then there are times when I'm letting things from the outside distract me. Mm -hmm. So, um, but those moments when I'm when I'm locked in, it's it's I'm on another planet, right? You know, yeah, and it feels great, and then you 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 think about it, and you know, and you're like, how did I just play that? And then all of a sudden you're out. Right. Again, you know, it's <laughs> yeah, like you yeah. got to stay. There's so many things that can pull you out. It's almost like being in like a, a, a like a warp speed tube or something like that, where you want to, if you want to, want to keep playing the right stuff, you got to stay in that tube because the yeah, slightest little thing will take you out and you know, all right. you got to jump back in again, you know? Right. So right. that's a challenge. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, uh, let, let's wrap it up here and, uh, let's, let's, uh, where can people find Joel Behrman? I know you have a website. I know you have um, an album out that you've done. I do. I have an album that's, I, th I think it's on, you know, you can definitely find it on iTunes and Spotify and all that stuff. I recorded it a long time ago, like seven, eight years ago or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's called Stepping Back. Uh, I have a website that I don't ever check <laughs> so and i don't update so I, i'm i'm kind of i kind of you're you know, off the grid you're going off I'm, the grid i'm pretty much off the grid and just you know working cat in this area but yeah. um 
but yeah, I mean, you go to my, my website, you can uh, email. I, I'll, I'll, if, if there's anybody here that wants to ask me questions... Um, I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, i put my yeah. email address. Mm-hmm. That's probably the best sure. thing. They can just email me personally. Yeah. And then, we'll put your website. Yeah, like yeah, that's fine. Yeah, put those links up. And, and the website is, is it Joel Berman Trumpet? It's it JoelBerman.com. Joel, Joel Berman. Wow, you got just your name. Yeah, I bought the domain and, wow. and then I managed to keep it, I think. Yeah. I don't know. Well, yeah, I was just on it. Yeah. yeah. So okay. Still got it. I'm good. I think <laughs> I have it on like auto renew or something. Oh, okay. So there you go. That way, I don't have really am hands off when it comes to my own. <laughs> yeah. There's so I couldn't do Jeff Lewis. There's so many of us. Oh so yeah, that's no right. Way. There's no way. Yeah. yeah, I'm lucky. There's one other Joel Behrman that I know of that's like a photographer or something. Oh, okay. Like that, so. All right. So you got so Joel Berman, Trump, uh, just joelberman.com. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Joel. Oh, thank you, man. I didn't expect to go this long, but I could actually go another hour. But oh, I'm easily. Trying to, easily. Yeah. Trump and talk. Oh, so fun. Let's do, let's do volume two. <laughs> volume two, I'm down. Yeah. All right, once again, thank you so much for uh, Joel Berman coming out today. Yeah, my pleasure. All right, All right. take care, y'all. Okay.